Hello everyone, I'm Brian Croy Dragon and welcome back to Oh jeez, what's going on with the volume? Hey, welcome back to Vox Adventures. For God's sake, do I have to lower this? Uh so this is the last video of the season. So what shall we talk about? How about we uh, talk some more movies for October? Of course you can't go wrong with Dracula. And yes I am pronouncing it in the correct way. Uh, there's a wide range of adaptations to choose from, but if you want the best, the most faithful, uh, go for the 1977 BBC miniseries, Count Dracula. Uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula is actually set in second place. It's a runner-up. Uh, Count Dracula doesn't... Uh, Do any reincarnate reincarnate uh, reincarnated love nonsense? <clears throat> Doesn't uh, make Dracula a romantic character? It's free of. Of uh, the the defilement of the Coppola film. Does it have its differences? Well, yes, of course. And despite what you might, what you may hear or read, uh, the character of Arthur Homewood isn't has is not dropped from the miniseries. He he's actually combined with Quincy Morris, creating. Quincy Homewood. Dracula does not grow younger uh, as he feeds on blood, but I think that's just a pragmatic decision. And of course, Dracula is destroyed by a stake, even though he was not in the original book, but in the original no book he wasn't beheaded either, so the Kovala film isn't exactly faithful in that regard either. But the changes in the Kovala film far exceed the changes in the BBC miniseries. Because the changes are quite few. As I said, uh, Dracula does not grow younger as he feeds on blood. Uh, Quincy and Arthur are combined into one character. Uh, Dracula is destroyed via a stake. And <clears throat> uh, the characters of Mina... Murray and Lucy Restenra are now sisters, with Mina's surname becoming Restenra. Obviously. Uh, 
Oh, for... Well, that helped. Uh, Count Dracula is not something for young children. It's rated 14A, so obviously you have to be over 14 to watch it. It's split between two episodes, and it really is the best. Um, adaptations before it and after it haven't exactly, uh, can't exactly hold a candle to it, but if you're interested, still check out the others. Um, but Little Lugosi really isn't the best Dracula, unless it's uh, in regards to adaptations of the play. Uh, Ladine Balderston play. What the? Oh, for... Are you kidding me? Of course, the, well, between the two adaptations of Dracula that were released in 1931, both by uh, Universal, it's the Spanish version you want to watch. It's vastly superior to the English language version. The writers are, uh, because Spanish audiences at the time were less uptight than uh, the English audiences, they were able to get away with more stuff. Things like costuming, things like violence. It's really interesting. But, was able to be uh, got out in a way with, and Carlos Villarreal really is a better Dracula than Bela Lugosi. The names of three characters are changed for the Spanish version, um, well, for obvious reasons. In the English version, Jonathan's Harker is shortened to John Harker. In the Spanish version, John Harker is called, well, he's not called John, but Juan. Uh, Mina, she's called Ava, and Lucy is called Lucia. As I said, the names are changed for obvious reasons. It's not like what was going on with Nosferatu, uh, where it was an unofficial adaptation, so all the names had to be changed for legal reasons. And I do highly recommend Nosferatu. It's a fantastic movie. Uh, may have made one of the stranger choices in uh, portraying a werewolf because a werewolf does appear uh, in the film in one scene and it's played by a striped hyena 
I nearly said spotted. Good lord, those things are just so pr they're so present in fiction that uh, I always had me saying the wrong type. So what else can I talk about? Of course, you might also want to check out the Hammer films, which starred Christopher Lee as Dracula, and Peter Cushing as Van Helsing and a few of them. Let's just say Dracula 1972 AD is a sight to behold. Do I have some movies set in the 70s? Yes. Yes, I do. And, um, of course, it would be the, the one with 1972 in the title. That would be the most 70s-ish of them all. Of course, you should also check out Nosferatu's remake, Nosferatu the Vampire. It's an interesting movie and was released in the same year when uh, Universal released a remake of their own adaptation of Dracula. And it's a little bit amusing. Uh, the Universal film that was released in 1979. Yeah, starred Frank Langella, who played Dracula on the stage, just as Bella Lugosi did. Well, Nosferatu the Vampire uh, starred Klaus Kinski, who did not, to my knowledge, did not play Dracula on stage, but rather he played. Renfield, uh, in the 1970 adaptation ca uh, uh, titled Count Dracula, just as the BBC miniseries was. And that was a not, and that film was a non, uh, Hammer appearance. God's sake. That was a non-hammer appearance. For Christopher Lee as Dracula. Uh, as a human being, Klaus Kinski was not uh, a great one, but as an actor, he was um, mm, 
Shakespeare. I mean, he was no Shakespearean actor, but as non-Shakespearean actors go, he was pretty good. Now, Nose for Roger the Vampire was directed by Werner Herzog. Um, if you're familiar, if you've seen The Mandalorian, he actually plays the Imperial. Well, I'm not sure how to how to exactly describe him, considering considering that the Empire's fallen. So, um, let's call him the Imperial Remnant Leader, since I don't remember his name. So yeah, Werner Herzog, if you've seen The Mandalorian, you you know who he is. He acts, he does a little bit of, he acts, he directs, and uh, him and uh, Klaus Kinski was a frequent star in his films. Uh, he's dead now, Klaus Kinski. Uh, round to the relief of his family and and his best friend Werner Herzog. Why do I call him his best friend? Because, well, Werner Herzog made a documentary about his relationship with Klaus Kinski and called it My Best Fiend. Yeah, that title alone should tell you enough about the relationship. They're doing the filming of one movie, and I'm not sure, I can't remember which one it was. Um, I can't remember the name, but I'm pretty sure it was the one... Uh, no way, I think I do remember the name. Agir Wrath of God or something like that. It's it's one of the inspirations for... I mean, obviously Apocalypse Now is based off of Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, but other works were looked to for inspiration, and Agir Wrath of God was one of them. Have I seen it? No. Am I familiar with it? Uh, yeah. And there's an uncomfortable moment where Klaus Kinski's character uh, speaks of a desire to marry his own daughter and this becomes uncomfortable in hindsight. Because as I said, Klaus Kinski is dead much to the relief of his family, and that's because he was... Now, forgive me for saying this, because this might go well past PG, but... He was sexually abusing his daughter, so you can understand why his death is a relief. He was not a he was abusing his daughters in all manners of ray of uh, ma all manner of race and it just yeah, his death was a relief. But you're probably but but uh returning that to the filming of Wrath of a Gear. At least I think that was the one. Uh, 
They were of course in location in summer tropical. Uh, rainforest might have been the Amazon. Uh, had lectures for local tribesmen. And of course Klaus Kinski was being his regular hard to work with self. And of course there's going to be people who are hard to work with, but if you're the subject of a film titled My Best uh, titled My Best Fiend, obviously yeah, that, that says enough, doesn't it? Anyway, the local chief actually he offered to have Klaus Kinski killed. He made the offer to Werner Herzog, and Werner Herzog actually legitimately considered it. Yeah, as a person, he wasn't that great. As non-Shakespearean actors went, he was good, but... Oh, Lord, he was really not a nice person. If you've ever taken film classes, you... Probably... No, another of Werner Herzog's films. And I think it's called Grizzly Man. Uh, let's check. Um, yeah. One of the post Klaus Kinski films. Because uh, Klaus Kinski died in the 90s, 1990, I think. And uh, if you've seen the Robin Williams film Awakenings, he has a cameo, uh, Werner Herzog, in that film. But uh, back to Nosferatu the Vampire, it, uh, with the book Dracula having fallen into public domain by that point, uh, they could actually use the original names. So, Hutter is once again... Jonathan Harker, uh, his wife Ellen is not exactly Mina, but rather Lucy, and Mina's a different character, who would be the Lucy one, uh, Annie Harding, in the original. Count Orlock is once again Count Dracula. Uh, Nock is once again Renfield. Bolwer is once again Van Helsing. Uh, Severs is not once again... Uh, Dr. Severs is, is not once again Dr. Seward because he's cut from the film. And I apologize for my little uh, lesson on Klaus Kinski. My explanation of why he was not that good a person.
Honestly, I would not have a lot. Uh, it's a good thing that. That, uh. Fairy. T the, fa the Fairy Tales Theater. Beauty and the Beast episode is. Do not have children in it because I would not have allowed that man near them. Uh, uh, no sane person would allow that that man near children. I would want to allow him near people. Period. Uh, if you're wondering who he played in the Beauty and the Beast episode of Fairy Tale Theater, he actually played the Beast himself. Yeah, he was a big fan of the Jean Cocteau adaptation from 1946, which the episode modeled itself after, and is a quasi-English language remake. It does a better job than the Disney version. Because that also borrows from the Jean Cocteau film. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about Beauty and the Beast? Are we talking about... Uh... The Madness that was Klaus Kinski? Madness, fiendishness, whatever you want to call them. The man was a devil. Devil, demon, whatever synonym you wish to use. You could call him a bogey for all I care. to Dracula. Of course you'll, if you want to, you can watch the Coppola film Bram Stoker's Dracula. It, it ironically feels, it, it's not exactly the most faithful and it's second with that 1970 film I mentioned being third. <coughs> Ironically, uh, people I've I've heard people compare it to Andrew Lloyd Webber's adaptation of Phantom of the Opera, and yeah, there are some similarities, such as the romance angle. So, if you want to uh, check out the Turkish language adaptation, which is actually based off of a uh, uh, <coughs> a 
based off of a case of a Turkish case of plagiarism that was that changed a bunch of things like names and setting and action and introduced the first case of Dracula being associated with Vlad the Impaler. I sometimes think about writing a homage to Dracula, the Dracula. Uh, set it post invasion of Quebec. About 1781. Yeah, 1781. Um, so, 18th century, which is even earlier than Nosferatu. Because that's set in 1838, uh, not not the Victorian. Around well, it's around. Well, I can't call it Victorian because it's set in Germany. So, I guess not for all who's set in Germany. While Dracula is obviously set. Well, well, do you know what I mean? It's across Transylvania to Wallachia. Uh, Wallachia however it's pronounced because Dracula does not actually live in Transylvania oh jeez well, no getting out of this or is there? Um, yeah. No, that's not it. But of course, if I bring up Dracula, then I can't not bring up Frankenstein, uh, my favorite of horror literature. Of course, I'm aware there's a film more, f there's an adaptation more faithful than Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but at the moment, the most faithful adaptation I've seen, period, is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is apparently at second place or first place on, on fidelity to the source material, depending on who, who you speak to. 
of course, at the moment, as I've said, it's the most faithful I've seen. And why not? Kenneth Branagh does typically do a lot in the fidelity department. Unless, of course, uh, he had no hand in the script writing. And even then he tries to make the best of what he can do and makes excellent movies regardless. Still, I recognize the Universal film uh, directed by James Rayon and starring Boris Karloff as the first sound adaptation. Yes, sound. Uh, there were adaptations before it. The first one, to my knowledge, uh, having been made in 1910 by Thomas Edison's company, uh, where Adam, as Mary Shelley referred to the monster, as it was played by Charles Ogle. I don't expect the name to mean anything, but he was one of those early actors. Uh, he has an uncredited role in Cecil B. DeMille's 1923 film, The Ten Commandments. And I think he also appears in a silent adaptation of A Christmas Carol. So again, yeah, he was one of those silent film actors, uh, obviously. But he did have a have a long running career. I mean obviously if you can go for more than one decade. Now I don't actually have as many adaptations of Frankenstein as I do uh, adaptations of Dracula and That has to do with the fact that uh, Dracula adaptations are quite easy to find. At least they were for me. Uh, there was a du I my Bram Stoker's Dracula and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein copies uh, came together in a double feature. And Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is actually the first Frankenstein film I ever saw. Uh, I caught it on TV during my high school years. And it was the first Kenneth Branagh directed film I ever saw. And it was fantastic. It still is fantastic. You, know, you can't get much better than Kenneth Branagh, be it director or actor. Oh, and Robert De Niro as Adam. That is fantastic. Helena Bonham Carter as Elizabeth, also fantastic. course you'll want to check out Young Frankenstein. It 
certain parodies the Universal films, and even reuses uh, the same scientific props for the laboratory. Oh, but Mary Shinny's Frankenstein is simply fantastic. Oh, looks like we got a mummy on our hands because that's what, yeah, that's what they're actually, that's what ranges are actually called on the Shakespeare language setting. Uh, Robert De Niro as Adam is a godsend. Uh, before it entered the hands of Kenneth Branagh, uh, Tim Burton was one of the people considered to direct the film. And his character to, to play uh, the sharp-featured man, Adam, the monster, whichever you wish to call him, uh, was Arnold Schwarzenegger, and good lord... No, 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 no! No, a thousand times no! Uh, other actors uh, considered for the role were phenomenal actors such as Jared, uh, Gerard Depardieu and Jeremy Irons. And then, meanwhile, you have the guy who wanted to cast Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, of course. Now, Mary Shunny's Mary Shunny's Frankenstein is actually my third introduction to Kenneth Branagh. Uh, I mean, obviously, no. Um, yeah, I think it was Walter El Dorado I saw first. Uh, caught it on TV once, uh, just near the end, so it wasn't the entire thing. But still, that was my first introduction. And then, of course, there was Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. You know, where he played Gilderoy Lockhart.
Okay, time to get out and in. Out of the boat into the water. Uh, for another set of movies for October, I obviously have to mention Ghostbusters. Well, I was introduced to Ghostbusters at a young age. Let's see, I think it might have been five when Teletoon started, and one of the shows they had because they didn't exactly have well they did have original programming but a lot of because it was a new channel a lot of their shows were also reruns of well older shows from before 1997 which is which I believe is when the show started Jeez. And so I was introduced to Ghostbusters through the animated show. Uh, later, uh, I woke up to discover my dad had gone out while I was asleep, and the house locked up, of course, and gone to a movie store and bought the original movie on VHS. Ugh, Dad, I love gifts. My loyal companion on my on our search for films. Jeez, the search for Greystoke, the Legend of Tarzan, Lord of the Apes, I think that went on for four years. <clears throat> four years. Now the current film that I'm searching for, The Fall of the Roman Empire, I won't be able to watch with him. Dad, if only you were still here. It was my dad that introduced me to the original Ghostbusters. My dad died in 2012. I didn't see Ghostbusters 2 until after his passing. I'd been on my way home from school because, as was my uh, custom, if I only had one class a day and it ended before 12, I'd walk home from college. I'd walk home, take a look at the stores, see if there was something I could find. So I stopped in at Shoppers Drug Mart. Um, that way. And there's a few Shoppers Drug Marts here in Oshawa, so... 
Oh, jeez, that doesn't help. There's two in that direction. There's two northwest of me. What am I doing? Yeah, anyway, you don't know where exactly I am, so I guess that doesn't matter. Um, but anyway. Yeah, uh, but a Ghostbusters double feature at Shoffer's Drug Mart, and that's how I saw the second. I do reckon, I, I do recommend both of them. I also saw the remake on net. I have seen the remake on Netflix, and it was actually not bad. Not bad at all. Now, did I see Extreme Ghostbusters? No. No, I... And I still haven't seen it. And not anything against the show, so that there's a lot of things to watch. And, uh, and currently, I have been working around outside of my October movie marathon. Uh, I've been watching... Disney's Gargoyles, and I do plan to get back to watching uh, the 1980s Astro Boy on Roku. So, as I said, there's a lot to watch. And, of course, I'm also watching The Mandalorian, so there you go. As I said, there's a lot to watch. Especially with YouTube channels and Twitch streams. One way, if you're looking for something spooky, uh, look up the channel Bedtime Stories on on YouTube. I love it. It deals with the paranormal, the cryptozoological, the extraterrestrial. It's fantastic. Excellent for this month. And even outside of this month. Uh, oh God, it. It's really done a good job at getting me scared at some points. Yeah, I remember one episode, it was late at night, I was the only one home, well, except for Alex, obviously, and, uh, and that being my cat, and of course, there was a lot of fear put in me, and I was just, I, w I was like, lock the doors, uh, Shut the blinds, all of that. Pull over the curtains. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. Um, what? Oh, okay, then. And I suppose I should keep talking, so, um, another movies, more movies for October. How about the Godzilla movies? Excellent, excellent. Um, 
Yeah, I really recommend the Godzilla movies. Yeah, make sure you've seen the original from 1954, Gojira. And of course it's English language version, Godzilla King of the Monsters. How was I first introduced to Godzilla? Oh, how do you think someone of my generation was introduced to it? I was born in 92. No, wait. No, yeah, the, Am the Roland Emmerich film in 1998 was the first one I saw, but... When did the Hesse era films get their release? Uh, I know, I know when they were made. I'm talking about over here in North America. Good lord, this is getting confusing. After the Roland Emmerich film, there was of course Godzilla the series, fantastic, vastly superior to the movie it spun off from. And for quite a few years, it I didn't get into Godzilla prof. I didn't get into Godzilla properly until I saw Godzilla vs. Biollante at a Rogers rental. So, of course, I got it. And... I was... confused... at first. Uh, why? Um... Because it starts off with the previous film, Godzilla 1980-whatever the year was, um, left off with Godzilla falling into a volcano. At least I think it was a volcano, I haven't seen the movie in years. Oh, what's going on on Discord? So, the next portion of the movie, Godzilla's messing for most of it, because, round well, he's stuck in a volcano. Or whatever it is. And there's a bunch of talk, like... Um... No, I don't know, until finally we get to... Until finally he's released and all that, and that's all we have for this season of Vox Adventures. Um... Later this month will be a special for the event. In the meantime, I'm Brian Croydragon signing out. Stay straight.